audience uh, who have attended some of our public lectures before, but one or two new faces as well. So I will introduce myself. I'm Martin Snowden, and I'm the Vice Chancellor of all Faculty of Engineering and Science, which accounts for the majority of the work that the university does down here at Medway. We're primarily engaged in disciplines of science, engineering, and pharmacy, and we have a very strong uh, research uh, institute that works alongside us in the broad disciplines. So this evening is the second lecture of a series of six public lectures. We've been putting on these public lectures for a number of years now. And what we're trying to do is to give uh, people an opportunity to come along and hear a little bit about the work that goes on in the university, but pitched hopefully in such a way that's understandable to the general public. So, uh, that, that's what we're trying to set out to do. Let's say this is the second of uh, the series. So this evening we're moving to the engineering side of the faculty. And uh, as you can see uh, from the title, uh, Dr. Julian Weddle here, who is a principal lecturer in engineering uh, within the faculty of engineering science, is going to talk to us about defense against the dark arts. Just before we move on to the lecture, just like for those again uh, who are new or it's the first time to attend one of these events, uh, there will be some tea and coffee and refreshments available immediately after the lecture, and there's also an opportunity, although we'll have some formal questions, there'll be an opportunity to talk informally to Jeremy at that point too. So without any further ado, I shall uh, let Jeremy uh, give his lecture, defense against the dark parts, market design, and the bomb disposal. Hello. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to apologise in case anybody came here uh, to see the lecture that was wrongly advertised as collaborative design of a bomb. Uh, we're not making bombs, we're making bomb disposal weapons. Uh, my name is Dr. Joe Goodall. Uh, I'm a principal lecturer in computer engineering. Uh, so my background is more computer-related things than sort of civil or electrical or mechanical. Uh, I, like many others of my generation, grew up on things like Transformers and uh, R2-D2 from Star Wars and Johnny Five from uh, Short Circuit. So these things really fueled my interest in robotics and computers, uh, which is what kind of made me get to this point, I suppose. Uh, it's been my privilege to work with some great people over the last five years or so. Uh, it's allowed me to explore some of my personal passions uh, for the good of others with the goal of saving lives in the long term. So through this lecture, I'll summarise the university's collaboration in the design of a bomb disposal robot uh, and offer you a demonstration uh, of the R&D system which we've got in the way at the back. Uh, but before we go further, I'm going to begin by explaining why we need these robots in the first place. So in 2010, the independent reported that IEDs, formerly called roadside bombs, accounted for around 80% of uh, British soldier deaths in Afghanistan. Uh, a panorama episode reported that soldiers were three times more likely to be killed by an IED uh, than gunfire. Okay? And in 2009, in Helmand, an average of 14 IEDs were being triggered or disarmed each day. Uh, some days, operators were so busy they were disarming up to 30 IEDs. Uh, and in those sorts of conditions, it's, it's a lot of work. So IED stands for Improvised Explosive Device. They're improvised in the sense that the creator uses whatever they have available to construct something with some sort of explosive capability. Uh, they use things like munitions that you can see in the, in the bottom right there, things that they find lying around or left over from some other, some other uh, wall type of scenario. Or they can even use household items to construct something with explosive capability. Combine this with some form of trigger, and this creates a device which will cause an explosion with the obvious, obvious intent to either harm or kill somebody. Uh, oh, I hit the wrong button. There we go. Uh, so IEDs are extremely dangerous to disarm. IED disposal, or IEDD, is considered the most dangerous job in the world. The challenge for a disposal engineer is it's often more beneficial to disarm an IED than it is to set, set off the bomb itself. The intelligence that can be gathered uh, about an IED is very important 
You can identify and locate the maker of an IED from the various metaphorical fingerprints that are left behind. So in 2013, General Sir Peter Wall, head of the British Army, officially opened an explosive search and disposal training regiment uh, at a new £100 billion facility in Bicester. This followed a campaign in Afghanistan which took the armed forces off guard. Yeah, the battlefield in Iraq looked very, very different from what was seen in Afghanistan. So a quote here from General Sir Peter Wall. Our explosive search and disposal teams do one of the most dangerous roles in the armed forces, often in the most hostile environments. But when considering the, the varied roles that the armed forces play, this is a notable statement. Unmanned ground vehicles, or UGBs, are in this context referred to as bomb disposal robots. They offer a way of tackling hazardous explosive devices whilst keeping the operator at a safe distance. The robot pictured in this image is a cutlass developed by Northrop Grumman, a particularly large and not very portable robot that may be hard to use in difficult to reach areas. Something of this size would, be, uh, would have to be delivered to a remote site using some larger manned military vehicle. So the following slide uh, will offer a short three minute demonstration of the role of the bomb disposal robot uh, and how they can play a positive part in the role of disposing an IED. Assassin 17 Cyrus. Go for Assassin 17. We are up to the suspect VVID. If you could inform me when you have the perimeter set so we can start robotic operations. Roger, copy. I have three of my elements in position. The fourth one's heading to the south position. Once they're in place, your perimeter is set. Assassin 17 Cyrus, I see your people are in position. We're going to start robotic operations now. You ready for me to start rolling, Sergeant Coward? Yeah, go ahead and start rolling. All right, Sergeant Coward, I'm getting up to the car right now. Okay. It does look like all the windows are shut, so I'm probably going to have to break one open. Assassin 17 Cyrus. Go for Assassin 17. We're going to knock one of the windows out and see if we can determine if there's anything in there. We definitely have wires and some type of device. We'll move a better position to find out what exactly what it is. Assassin 17 Cyrus, we do have a confirmed IED that is confirmed. It's in the back seat. Yeah, it's a propane tank. Looks like some type of PMR battery source. Okay. And some piece of ordnance. Assassin 17, Cyrus. Go for Assassin 17. We do have a verified IED. Roger, copy actual IED. I will up channel two battalion. All right, Sergeant Cowart, I'm setting up right now. I'm gonna go ahead and pop that window. Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, you're good to go. All right. Once you see smoke, you got six minutes to get it up and get the get the robot back so we don't blow the robot up. Roger that. Ready? One, two, three, pull. Smoke. We are placing the charge now. Time of detonation will be approximately three minutes, 15 seconds. Roger, copy, 315. We'll keep our heads down. All right, Sergeant Cowart, right now I am uh, putting the charge in the window. Okay, tell me once you've got the charge in and the robot's arm out of the vehicle, please. All right, I got place perfect. All right, I'm heading, up, I'm heading back up range, Sergeant Cowart. Okay, bring her on down. Attention all the staff, and I want a 30 seconds, 30 seconds till detonation. Nice. Assassin 17, Assassin 17, Cyrus. We're going to uh, drive down and ensure the area is safe. That's what happens when you put an IED in the backseat of your car. As you can see from the video there, the bomb disposal robot can play an important part in the role of bomb disposal. The robot shown was clearly very large. Uh, it would be difficult to move around without being able to some sort of uh, supporting manned vehicle. 
A preferable alternative would, would be a man with portable UGB, such as his kinetic dragon mother, shown in the image. These types of robots are lightweight, they're backpackable. Uh, they're multi terrain robots capable of detecting a variety of devices without putting the operator in harm's way. But there are only a limited number of manufacturers of lightweight bomb disposal robots, especially in the UK. Our collaborative journey begins with an SME uh, based in the port town of Folkestone. So NIC, uh, a few representatives at the back there from them. Uh, NIC was founded in 1959 as makers of surgical instruments. During the 50s, the company developed a range of visual inspection equipment based upon modified medical devices. These small visual inspection probes developed into a range of larger inspection equipment used to search for suspect devices. Since the early 90s, NIC have worked closely with the British Army, high threat and bomb disposal operators. They developed the first hook and line systems, a suite of equipment to permit remote operations within an IED disposal environment. Some of these pictures up here you can see, you've got the hooks, you connect them up and you can interact with things from a distance, from a safe distance, by pulling on the ropes. I'm sure there's a lot more to it than that. During a more recent campaign, such as Afghanistan, NIC has been manufacturing the PMEC, or the Personal Mine Extraction Kit, a pack carried by every soldier with the essential tools to extract from a minefield, should they find themselves caught within one unexpectedly. In addition, they manufacture on the right there a vehicle extraction kit. Another device manufactured by NIC is the telescopic manipulator. As you can see, this is an extendable probe uh, pole with a claw attached to the end. To me, it looks like the beginnings of a bomb disposal robot. The company took the decision as a natural progression to take their experience of IED disposal forward and begin manufacture of a, of a full R&D bomb disposal robot. As manufacturers of this type of equipment, they already have a strong foot in the door with IE, within the IEDD marketplace. Having observed their potential competitors offering robots with basic functionality at higher value, they firmly believed that they could offer a homegrown UK developed ROV which could rival the competition on both functionality and price. When R&D began, NIC was predominantly a mechanical manufacturing company. Its workforce consisted largely of technician level engineers and a small number of mechanical design engineers. From the point of view of developing a bomb disposal robot, this skill set covers like, the physical design of the robot, along with any moving parts, uh, as well as the manufacturing capability for assembling the final system. There is, however, a lot more to the design of a bomb disposal robot. The electrical and electronic engineering discipline is responsible for understanding the best way to power the robot, design of the onboard electronics uh, to communicate with the various robots' subsystems. The computer engineering discipline is responsible for developing the software for the operators to interact with, as well as the embedded software to bring the robot's electronics to life. The former School of Engineering, now part of the Faculty of Engineering Science, was able to fill these voids and help NIC through its R&D journey. So the university started on this R&D journey with NIC in 2009. Together, we entered into a Knowledge Transfer Partnership, or KTP. The KTP offers engineering and manufacturing businesses access to collaborative funding, innovative ideas, and academic expertise, and the opportunity to enhance creativity, effectiveness, and productivity within their business. The KTP is part funded by a government grant. For this KTP, NIC paid 40%, and the government, through the former Technology Strategy Board, now Innovate UK, paid 60%. In the image here, you see in the middle Steve Wisby, who's also in the audience, Managing Director of NIC. On the right, uh, Steve Woodhead from the University of Greenwich, who's also sitting down at the back. And on the left hand side, Waka Ami. Through the KTP, Waka's role was as a KTP associate. He worked on half the university based at NIC, and Waka was managed by the two Steves. 
Wacker's role was to take ownership of the KCP project and work towards building a working ROV, offering both the electronic and computer engineering skills required to complete the task. I was involved in this project from the point of view of a technical uh, advisor, supporting Wacker in some of the technical software aspects of the project, as per my background. As part of the project, Wacker had a training budget to help him develop the necessary skills and expertise to undertake this role. This included some management training, as well as technical training on the specialist skills required to complete the project. The KTP focused on the overall system of the bomb disposal robot. So this can be broken down into two distinct parts. The operator control unit, or OCU, can be considered the laptop, uh, an accompanying part which stay with the operator throughout the process of using the system. The remote operated vehicle, or ROV, can be considered the robot itself. The OCU and ROV typically communicate over a wireless communication channel, although a tethered option is available for missions which might require radio silence. There are two parts uh, to the communication link problem. The first being the transfer of video from the ROV to the OCU, so the operator can see what the ROV is doing from a distance. The second being a command control information type channel. So the operator, when they move the joystick, sends a command to the ROV telling it what to do and gets a response back confirming it's doing it. The ROV itself has a host of subsystems inside it. The traction part of the system is, part, is uh, the part of the system which rotates the tracks and is used for driving. We've got the uh, turret arm and claw, which is the part of the system mounted on top of the chassis and gives the operator a manipulator, an arm, to be able to uh, interact with things within the environment. The system has flippers to aid maintaining an appropriate centre of balance, specifically used for climbing upstairs. I hope you'll see some demos of these things later. Uh, it also has cameras and lights for providing visual feedback from the ROV in all light conditions. Unfortunately, on completion of the KTP, Wacker chose not to stay with IC. In an IC. As an interim measure, the university agreed to support NIC by learning and retaining a technical understanding of the system developed by Wacker to allow this knowledge to transfer over into Wacker's replacement. Whilst this work wasn't covered by the KTP, there's still financial support available for companies who choose to do this type of R&D work. For example, the Manufacturing Advisory Service offered grants between £303,000 towards R&D, and a company may apply for several of these types of grants a year. In addition, R&D &D Relief for Corporation Tax offers small to medium enterprises 225% tax relief on this type of R&D cost. This means that for every £100 of R&D expenditure made by NC, their corporation bill, uh, corporation tax bill, is reduced by an additional £125. You may be wondering why grants and tax relief are available for R&D in the first place. Why invest the taxpayers' money uh, into companies like this? Manufacturing contributes to over half of UK exports. It employs two and a half million people. Manufacturing costs uh, contribute 6.7 trillion to the global, global economy, and in the UK is the, in the world's top 10. Manufacturing makes up 10% of the UK gross value added. Essentially, the UK government has seed funding future corporation tax income and has a proven track record over the years that Putting this investment in yields a strong return. Oh, just moved on. The university is currently working toward the end of a second KTP with OIC. For this KTP, the associate, Matt Taylor, sitting just over there, uh, a graduate from the University of Greenwich, worked toward developing smart control capabilities of the robot, requiring some sophisticated techniques automating some of the actions the robot performs. To achieve the outcomes of this KTP, a redevelopment of the software the operator interacts with uh, and is used to control the robot was required. This work didn't fall under the work plan of the KTP 
And the university completed this alongside as part of ongoing consultancy uh, support. The second KTP had a strong focus on adding advanced algorithms to support the smart control of a robot. An interesting challenge for this part of the project was determining where the intelligence should go. We could put some really smart things in. Where else does it go? Does it go on the laptop? Does it go in the robot? The OCU includes, among other things, a Toughbook laptop with a reasonably, reasonably powerful processor and plenty of memory. This would have the capability of undertaking smart control work. However, much of the advanced control would need to occur on the ROV, near to where the motors are actually being controlled. The outcome of this analysis led to the decision to place a powerful embedded computer within the ROV itself. This allowed us to focus the problem domain down to a smaller part of the system. The powerful embedded computer sitting within the robot uses a, a Linux-based operating system. Linux, unlike Windows, is free and open source, although like many find when using this type of technology, free to use doesn't always mean free, as there are other costs in integrating uh, open source technologies into a company. In addition, well, as we were already building on open source technologies, we were able to adopt OpenRave, so it was the Open Robotics Automation Environment which allowed us to integrate advanced motion planning techniques into the robot itself. OpenRave works by allowing you to simulate what your robot would do in a virtual environment before committing to carrying out a procedure for real. The benefit being it can calculate plans to accomplish various advanced maneuvers by determining potential collisions in advance and providing a collisionless execution plan. This video is demonstrating some of the motion planning capabilities of OpenRave using a very simplified model of the NIC bomb disposal robot. The planner is provided with a position that the arm needs to move to. It plans the move and the visual on screen is showing uh, the result of what the planners come up with. With the motion planning part of the problem solved, the challenge then becomes completing the given motion on a real robot in a predictable way, uh, similar to that that's shown in the virtual environment. There are a lot more constraints in moving a real robot in the real world than there are moving a virtual robot in a virtual world. More on that in a little while. So after a long R&D process, NIC are now in a very positive position of having sold several robots. Uh, and in the running for further sales. Now the ROV is generating income, the challenging journey of productionizing a research and development robot is well underway. As expected in a high volume, uh, sorry, high value, low volume manufacturing scenario such as this, the lead time of delivering a product is relatively long, six months to a year. Although the amount of work to do during this time is substantial, and we're looking forward to continuing to support NIC through their transition. In advance, I'm going to apologise for this slide. I'm trying to make it do some really interesting things. It didn't, doesn't always work. Uh, but I'm hoping for the best. So now we're going to look a little deeper uh, at the ROV's design. The ROV is highly modular with a detachable claw, arm and flippers. This means that the system could be reduced to several smaller parts allowing the team to share the overall weight. Are you going to work? Yes, you are. Good. The main chassis houses most of the electronics. In between the tracks on the left... Uh, oh, hang on, where should we go? There we go. In between the tracks on the left side are easily interchangeable batteries, and on the right side is a radio chamber. The front and rear flippers are fully detachable, additions to the driving tracks and offer the ability to increase the ROV's centre of gravity by having them extend outward. They allow for increased stability, particularly in stair climbing, where they are extensively used uh, and are very useful for climbing over obstacles or obstructions. Whilst the arm shown in the video 
uh, is a three section arm. It is possible to have two or one section arms. The chassis can also be used without an arm if required. The claw itself can open and close as well as rotate, ideally suited for grabbing hold and lifting things or opening up doors. The arm allows the operator to access uh, low places such, uh, such as under a motor vehicle or high places such as overhead compartments on aeroplanes in the search for suspect devices. The current design supports up to five cameras, one in the claw, a Nomad camera which can be mounted in various places, a pan tilt camera which offers a 360 degree view, a rear camera and a front camera. Each camera unit, uh, with the exception of the pan tilt camera, houses white and infrared lights for operating within poorer lighting conditions. The OCU uh, is pictured on the screen there. It's a tough book, essentially a tough book touchscreen laptop mounted inside a protective uh, hardened storage case. Uh, it is accompanied by two three-axis joysticks to enhance the user control of the system. In addition, the case uh, includes a military specification battery, the same used on the ROV. Uh, it includes data and video radios and a few other peripheral computer components in underneath. The software powering the tough book and in turn remote control in the ROV was developed by the university for NIC, adopting many of the latest software development techniques. It offers a head-up display style control interface with the video feed from the ROV displaying where you can see the coloured stripes and the image. And the user interface is overlaid on top with transparencies used to prevent the interface from restricting the video feed. In comparison to many of the other uh, operator control units, they tend to have a small panel with their video feed coming up. Very restrictive. This makes the video feed full screen. In the top left there, uh, there are video and image capture options. In the middle, we've got camera switching and light control. So you can turn on off lights and switch between which camera view you would like to have. Communication is in the top right. The little cross there means it's not got a connection to the robot. Okay. At the bottom of the screen are on-screen representations of the joysticks. The intention being, if required, we can have the touch screen use uh, the operator use a touch screen. Although at the moment, the joysticks are the preferred route. They give you visual feedback of what you're doing with the joystick. Uh, we've got option buttons for switching between control modes and various other options, I won't go into too much detail, for helping a, uh, the operator through the process of using the system. So some of, these, uh, some of these features can only be seen on a working OCU. So what I'm going to do right now is switch over, hopefully without bringing anything, to uh, the OCU screen. So the OCU automatically detects which type of arm is connected to the ROV and whether a claw is attached and displays an on-screen 3D model. Doesn't seem to be there. Oh, there it is. We have an on-screen visual representation of what the robot is, what position the robot is in right now. I'll use the, the cursor here, but you can do it with touch screen. The on-screen model is three-dimensional. You can rotate it and see it from different points of view. Uh, it, re it requests the position of each of the joints on the robot and keeps the on-screen visual up to date with the real ROV. The camera subsystem includes a camera multiplexer, so you can see multiple cameras on the screen at once in various configurations. Here's just one configuration with, with our four camera view. There we go. Another camera view there, so you can see a main view with, with four side views. is used uh, where are we to relate, to relate user control elements such as joystick, uh, joystick actions to the 3D model and camera switching to the camera viewport. So you can see him, the blue outline around this joystick. 
This means if I twist on the z-axis of the joystick, I'm going to be controlling these parts of the system. Okay, on the far hand side there, we've got the up, down, left and right, which is orange, which will control the tracks. The same with the video feed. At the top, you can see the various video cameras with their icon representations, and then the video feeds in here uh, have a, a colored border to show you which one relates to which. One of the benefits of color coding is that the interface remains free of text to avoid making the interface uh, only usable by English speakers. And it's also free of icons, which can easily restrict the operator's view or background video. Video image shown is of the live video feed from the robot itself. My colleague, Joe Yule, is about to come over and give you a demonstration of driving a robot uh, around the room. I'm not going to do it because I'm not trained appropriately to drive the robot. And I don't want to crash it. Right. I did have some music to this, didn't I?
itself has an onboard embedded computer with enough processing power to arrive on a laptop. Interestingly, the computer in the ROV has 46,500 times more processing power and 15,500 more, uh, times more RAM than the computer that took them to the moon. The previously discussed open rate library allows us to perform some really advanced maneuvers. We call these things smart moves. I'm hoping this is going to work. Remember, this is an R&D system. We're in the process of productionizing. So, uh, with the smart moves, we can obtain a plan to allow the robot to transition from one state to another without the potential for colliding with itself. You can move the robot to any position and obtain a plan to move the robot back to a known position or an operator recorded position, which is a, a fairly recent recent addition. So for example, I'm going to use the mouse so you can see what I'm clicking on here. If I clicked on this icon here, to have the arm go straight up with not getting any shake in the head, so don't do that. So it must be a good thing. <laughs> the first thing that happens is a message is sent down to the robot, can you give me a plan to move yourself from here to here? The ROV then does all the all the hard number crunching work and sends a response back to those things saying, yeah, to get from there to there I have to do these things. The OCU is displaying on a 3D model what that plan would be. How am I going to get from there to there based upon a given plan? While the operator is happy with that, they can choose to execute the plan by hitting the go button. What it does is it has a series of waypoints. To get from this point to this point, you've got to go to there, then to there, then to here, and eventually you'll be in the right position. So it executes each waypoint one after the other, making sure it's definitely arrived. Yeah, it's, it's quite high, isn't it? <laughs> Put it back. <laughs> Put that back. There we go. Get a plan, come back, and don't forget the tape. I don't mention the price, but you wouldn't want to swap off the table. There you go. We're, we're on time. So as mentioned earlier, the ROV is highly modular, allowing for parts to be detached and the overall system weight to be shared amongst the team. Switch this off. So the claw itself can be fully detached from the system. Uh, it might be really smartly done up, might it? No? So you can just undo a small bracket there. Get the right there. there so you can just detach component parts like this. I should have folded down the arm because it's going to be really difficult for me to lift up, isn't it? But essentially the arm comes off in the same way. Uh, I'll do that. And that. And I think that's about it, isn't it? Cool. Okay. That one. Any others? That one. I've pretty much unplugged everything. <laughs> uh, and essentially, you can detach the arm just like that. Magic. It's probably not the same, aren't it? So it could be that in a specific application, we don't need it We can just turn it back on now and drive it around. I've lost my notes. I've got nothing. So when we switch this back on, the ROV will detect that its arms no longer connected, send the message back to the MCU, and the on-screen vision will be updated with a no arm representation. Okay. So in conjunction with the R&D work we do with NIC through the KTP, we're currently investigating approaches for integrating environment mapping to aid the user, inter aid the user interaction. Um, moved on, I'm not moving it back. There we go. And we've stopped my slide. Let's go back. There we go. Oops, give me a bit shadow. Oh, I'm not really Okay. So the idea here, uh, this works by the process of simultaneously locating a robot's position within an environment whilst building up a map of that environment at the same time. A technique known as SLAM. Modern approaches uh, to this use a depth camera such as Microsoft Connect, the sort you get with your games console. Uh, these capture images, uh, so RGB images, regular camera images, as you see in the top left, as well as depth images, like what we can see down here, how, thing, how far things are away from us. 
Once you have this, you can get the R of eta, and once you take these bits of data, you can then build up a three-dimensional model of what the environment looks like. And essentially, you get the R of eta drive around, or generate a plan around a 3D model, and then execute that in the real world. Another area of research currently being investigated by PhD student Darren Smith, Darren Hurley Smith, <coughs> sorry, is in the collaborative task distribution and secure communication of swarms of robots. This research attempts to understand in a scenario where we have a lot of robots and a specific job that they all need to do, how do we break down the task into smaller pieces? Who does which pick which parts? And how do the robots communicate this with each other in a secure way? Whether the robot is an unmanned ground vehicle, like the bomb disposal robot, or an unmanned aerial vehicle, like the quadcopter you can see in this picture. Uh, the approach is, is pretty much the same. In fact, in the future, each may play their part in carrying out a mission, with ground vehicles working uh, down below, while aerial vehicles fly overhead, working together and talking to each other. So to sum up, what the, the university has helped in SME by plugging an R&D skills gap whilst helping embed those skills firmly within the company. NIC have a strong team, including an electrical electronic engineer and a recently employed computer engineer, to complement its existing workforce, providing a skilled in-house team to undertake future R&D. The university have helped the company through R&D and into production, and we're very proud to have played a part in the company's continued success. We did get a lot out of this ourselves, to start with, it's allowed us to keep up to date with the latest developments in our fields and kept us fresh for student delivery. Everything we do feeds back into our lectures. I have a five-year course which has been designed around some of the concepts and techniques adopted during our collaboration. We have industrially relevant projects to offer our students at bachelor's, master's and PhD level and a clear focus on either generating academic papers uh, to publish the work, or at least show how the work fits within a commercial context. Working with uh, companies helps the university understand the commercial environment, allowing us to aim our research efforts at things we can see will be of value, offering a route to potentially commercialising any future uh, uh, intellectual property. So I would like to end here by thanking you for your time. I'd like to open up to answering any questions you may have.
Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, you know the core, yep. the base catch ball, is there different types of cores for different situations? It might be a scenario where you just don't need a claw. So you can take the claw off and put on, I think an example would be a sensor array detecting you know, environmental data. You know, maybe it's been using a radiation type environment, you want to get radiation readings back, send the robot in without a claw, just with some sensors on it instead. So that's the idea, you don't need a claw in all scenarios, not everybody wants one. Yeah, we, we have this conversation of wireless communications all the time in all of our research environments. Um, if someone were to jam a radio frequency, nothing would work. There's nothing anybody can do about it. You can try and switch frequencies. Um, that's one option. With this robot, the, the radio's on for a specific frequency. If you were to jam that frequency, the, the alternative is to apply a tether onto the system with a reel on the back, and perhaps you need a trail of fiber optic behind you and communicate over, over fiber instead. Answer no, <laughs> um, because the the robot and the um, laptop are in constant communication, and any signal sent from the laptop is authenticated before the robot follows the action. Oh, I see. So it's got like an authentication, authentication signature that goes along with it. Yeah. And if it doesn't detect that, it ignores it. It ignores it. Says so it's not from an authorized sender.
the red map will start, but I think maybe we could lead the way uh, to the tea and coffee. But I'd like to introduce you the Dead Girl Diary. Uh, again, we're moving into something completely different. We're moving to the next section to the work of the National Resources Institute, which is a large research and development uh, institute within the faculty. And um, it's the, the lectures on Wednesday, the 3rd of December, so the date of your diary, at the same time, same place. And it's all about killing insects without chemicals, which again is, is a big part of the world that we're doing in our life. The question is can we use insect diseases to control pests without our environment? So the date of your diary is that one. So thank you very much for coming. I'm sure Joe and the rest of the team. We're more than happy to answer questions in Fawley, up to an accepting office. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, please come and join us for some tea and coffee. Thank you very much.